As we continue our study in the book of Ephesians, we'll focus attention upon verses 14 through 18 in chapter 2. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it having put to death the enmity. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. Last week we considered the transforming power of God's grace. And today I would like for us to look at the agent of that grace. Jesus Christ is the agent of that power of grace. And we need to know him well. This seems rather stark, but think about it for a moment, if you will. Everything that we have in this life is temporary. We will either be separated from those things or they from us. So that in the very end, if there is no resurrected Christ, we have nothing. But if Jesus Christ is there, we can lose everything and still have it all. And this is why it's important for us to take a look at Jesus Christ as the amazing agent of that grace. We ask the question then, who is this Jesus Christ? And what way is Jesus Christ our peace? Titus 2.11 For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. To begin with, when we take a look at Jesus Christ, when we take a look at the incarnation, when we take a look at the birth, we take a look at the years of humiliation that he walked on this earth, and now when we see him in his exaltation, we need to know exactly who Jesus Christ is. And he is the grace incarnate. Notice that grace is not an abstract concept. It is not reduced to just the actions of God. It is clearly presented to us in the person. The more we know Jesus Christ, the more we know about the grace of God. And if we want to know the grace of God, then we need to be sure that we are taking proper interest in Jesus Christ. I would encourage you, if you're reading through Ephesians as we go through this, just have a piece of paper by the side and note in the margin of that paper the verse. The verse that speaks of Jesus, either directly or indirectly. And if all of those words that point to Jesus Christ were taken from the epistle, we would have nothing but fragments to know anything about the grace of God. And as the grace of God, notice who he is. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, you be who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. In this verse alone, see who Jesus Christ is for us. When we lack wisdom, we go to Jesus Christ. When we need and we understand our need for righteousness, we go to Jesus Christ. When we understand the need for sanctification, we go to Jesus Christ. When we want to speak of our redemption, we speak of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. When it comes to wisdom, he is the one who guides and directs us. He gives to us the knowledge and the proper application, and he alone is our wisdom to live the life that is pleasing to him and pleasing to our Heavenly Father. Notice, not only did he become our wisdom, but he is our righteousness. God caused Jesus Christ to take the sins of the world upon himself so that his righteousness could be imputed to us. When it comes to the righteousness that we need to stand before a righteous God who is judge of all mankind, it is the righteousness of Jesus Christ that causes us to be accepted into the glory of the greatness of his kingdom. 
And when it comes to sanctification, when it comes to matters of growing in grace, growing in grace is not just knowing more about God's word. Growing in grace is a process that goes on that ends when we are conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. There's no such thing as sanctification apart from Jesus Christ and the matter of redemption. All the time it seems on the news whether this person will be able to redeem himself or that person will be able to redeem himself or herself. It becomes a question of no standing because there is no redemption apart from Jesus Christ. Notice that Jesus is the either or. These words are the proper application and understanding when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He is either the greatest egotist the world has ever known or he is telling the truth. I am the way, there is no other. I am the truth, there is no more. I am the life, you find it nowhere but in me. Jesus Christ is either the truth teller or he is the liar. But in all of those things, we find him to be our righteousness, we find him to be our sanctification, we find him to be our redemption, we find him to be our propitiation, for he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Everybody in this world can get angry except God. If God gets angry, there's something the matter with him. There's a breakdown in communication, and it's his fault. Totally untrue. God created this world, he created it for a purpose, and he expects us, his people, to live by that purpose. And when we deny that purpose, we deny him. We deny his goodness, and we say, we can do a better job of it than you can, Lord. And once we find out that we're in a dilemma that we cannot get out of ourselves, we understand that God is duly and properly angry. And he has the right to be angry. But notice Jesus Christ on the cross has become the propitiation for our sins. He has satisfied the anger of God that we might be accepted by God through Jesus Christ. He is our righteousness. He is our sanctification. He is our redemption. He is our propitiation. He is our hope. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God, our Savior, and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope. Notice he is not one who makes hope for us. He is not one who speaks of hope as though it is objective to himself. He is hope. And anything that can be stated about hope comes from the person of Jesus Christ. And this is why he is so important to you and me. When we call ourselves Christians, we call ourselves the followers of Christ. And when we call ourselves the followers of Christ, we understand that he and he alone makes every provision for all of our needs now and forevermore. And even though the world that we live in may be hopeless, even though our circumstances may be hopeless, we still have hope because we have Christ, and he alone is our hope. And for that reason, notice that he is our life. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. The conclusion to one sanctification to stand before God, created in the image of Jesus Christ, accepted because of Jesus Christ, we understand what life is. Jesus Christ is our life. We can find life nowhere else except in him. We can be called narrow-minded because we say Jesus alone is the only way. We can be called all of these things, but name one movement, name one person who can put together such a presentation as we see here in the person of Jesus Christ. Write them down, note them well. Wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, propitiation, hope, life, and he is our peace. For notice that we come back to our starting passage. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Paul gets very emphatic at this verse. Notice, for he himself, and we could extend it to say, for he himself and no other is our peace. When it comes to the understanding of peace, notice it is the person of Jesus Christ. 
He himself and he alone is our peace, and he is of the one who made both groups, Jew and Gentile, come together in one, and he is the one who broke down the barrier of that dividing wall, that we might be made one together in the person of Jesus Christ. And when that wall came down, notice that any other barrier between the nations goes away in the person of Jesus Christ. And he is then our peace in the broadest sense of the term. And notice for you and for me today that this has proper application for our living. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of, has come, the kingdom is coming. The kingdom has come in its, per, in its prince and in its principles, and it will be coming in the glory of our great King, Jesus Christ. But until such a time, we need to keep our priorities straight. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. The kingdom of God is righteousness, it is peace, and it is joy in the Holy Spirit. Our concern is not so much the matters of this world, our concern is the matter of the kingdom. Am I truly living the life of righteousness? Do I express the peace and the joy that is mine in, Je in Jesus Christ that is brought to me by the indwelling spirit? And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, in what way is Jesus Christ our peace? And we ask the question then, what did he do? to bring about such things as sanctification and peace and righteousness and redemption and hope. Although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, what did Jesus do for us? He met us at the point of our hostility and the alienation that follows from that. Jesus Christ made the first step. Jesus Christ came to us. He came to us when we wanted nothing to do with him. He came to us when we were hostile in mind and were engaged in evil deeds to demonstrate the hostility and how much we do not want God in our lives. And the same is true in Romans chapter 8. Because the mind is set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. It is not only something that we do by choice, but it, that choice is by nature. Notice because the mind itself, the thinking process, the foundational values are all hostile toward God. And it does not subject itself to the law of God, nor is it even able to do so. That is how deeply committed one is when there is no saving grace. And there is not only then the hostility between God and man, but notice that there is the hostility between one another. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ that are in Judea, for you also endured the same sufferings at the hand of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews. They are not pleasing to God, but they're hostile to all men. When we take a look at what's going on in current events, and we see the hostility between nations, friends, the foundation of that is hostility toward God. The foundation for that is the unbelief that expresses itself in hostility. And we all know quite well that there will not be the kind of unity and oneness that the globalists and the universalists talk about until Jesus Christ comes as King of kings and Lord of lords. And then and only then will every knee bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Lord of all. And notice that when he did come, he met us at the point of our hostility and our alienation. He came to us to do away with the hostility. He came to us to do away with the alienation, and he changed our relationships, for he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. 
In every way, when we think of peace, we have to go back to the person of Jesus Christ. For he is the one who has changed our relationships. And he has made the two warring parties into one group and one new humanity. This is the thing that we need to keep in mind. Jesus Christ is not merely in the business of saving souls, as important as that is. He is creating a new world order. And I deliberately use those terms to put it in the face of those who are so secular. The world order that they talk about will never happen until Jesus Christ comes. And he is preparing that time by making hearts of men and women right with Jesus Christ. And he made the two parties into one new humanity. And that is what is going on in the church of Jesus Christ. When you take a look at church history, some of the historians have basically said the church of Jesus Christ should have never made it through the end of the first century. And there's plenty of other times that it seemed to be in jeopardy. When you and I were young and we were going to church, what would we hear from some of the evangelists and some of the preachers? Communism has come to China and it has destroyed the church. Communism has come to Europe and it has destroyed the church. The bamboo curtain fell, the iron curtain fell, and guess what? The church was there, and in many instances, the church was stronger than when the bamboo and the iron curtain was put in place. No one defeats the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he is going to reconcile them to the cross. And he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by having put to death the enmity. You and I are in the business of speaking of peace. You and I are in the business of speaking of love, the peace that comes from Jesus Christ, the love that comes from God, the righteousness that is the outpouring of his grace. This is our business. This is our duty. This is why we are here. How many times have we heard over our lifetime as Christians, if heaven is such a great place, why aren't you there? Answer, I get there in my due time. Answer, I'm staying here to at least let you know that it's there and to let you know how to get there, and that is the way Jesus Christ. And notice that he is the one who reconciles and eliminates the hostility and the establishment of friendship, and that friendship speaks finally of peace. Thus being reconciled, and the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the third element to peace. I have emphasized over the years, over the months, that peace is, first of all, coming to the cessation of hostility. Peace, secondly, then, is reconciliation and friendship. With the reconciliation and friendship, there comes a sense of personal peace and well-being, as we read it here in Philippians. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. As long as we are in this world, there will be turmoil. As long as we are in this world, we will be caught up in that turmoil. There will be turmoil around us. There will be turmoil in our lives. And notice that the peace is not just a sensibility. It is not just an attitude. It is not just the sense of well-being. Notice that the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and will guard your minds in Christ Jesus. That's a military term. The peace of God is going to guard my heart. The peace of God is going to guard me, my mind. I face turmoil, but I still have the peace that surpasses all understanding and it is surrounding me for my protection and for yours. And notice that he gave his life to us. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The peace that surpasses all understanding is so tied in with the reconciliation that we will never have that peace until we are reconciled to God through the person of Jesus Christ. And God reconciled all things to himself in Christ. Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body 
through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Notice he has made us already acceptable to the Father. He has reconciled us through his death for this purpose, to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. The day Jesus died on the cross, Don Furrow's name was there. Put in Don Furrow's name, replace it with yours. And he did so because he wants to present you and me totally acceptable to the presence of God the Father. And notice we will be holy and blameless and beyond reproach because of Jesus Christ and the cross. And he reconciled all things through Jesus Christ. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Notice the focal point is Jesus Christ. Notice that the foundation is Jesus Christ. And he is the one who reconciles all things to himself. And he made peace through the blood of the cross, whether it's things on earth or things in heaven. Specifically, he was the Father's agent in the ministry of reconciliation. And now, all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. This day, when you have confessed Christ as your Savior, when we have done that, we are not only reconciled to Christ, but we are reconciled to the Father through Christ. I can call him my Father. I know that he is not angry with me. The anger has been handled at the cross with Jesus Christ. And this is why we say there is nothing, no one more important than Jesus Christ. And we see that here. How did he do it? He did it through the cross and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And once again, he did it in the fleshly, bodily way by way of death. Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. He took our place. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God. Notice the Father made the Son who was sinless to become sin on our behalf. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Notice the plan. The plan is to get us back to where he intended us to be. The plan is to make us acceptable so that I can stand before the king eternal and stand accepted in the righteousness of his son. For notice that our trespasses are not held against us. Namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Notice these words. Stick with these words. How many times have we as Christians met other Christians along the way? Maybe we have been with them one time or another. In that, there are things that we have done in our past that we cannot deal with. Understand this, that when God forgives, nobody has the right to hold anything against ourselves, not even ourselves. When I stand forgiven, I stand forgiven, and I do not have the right to condemn myself because I stand condemnation free because of Jesus Christ. By abolishing in his flesh the enmity, the commandments contained in the ordinance, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, establishing peace, that he might reconcile them both into one body to God. Notice he has put to death the enmity. And the positive aspect, he came and he preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. When we hear somebody say that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is the proclamation of peace that the Son of God would give 
if he were standing in our place. But we are standing in his place, and this is what we are to do. We are to preach peace to those who are near and to those who are far. And notice the shalom of God. In that upper room, just before his own crucifixion, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. These things I have spoken to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. If Jesus Christ has overcome the world, we too can overcome by the power of Jesus Christ. I leave with you peace. My peace I give to you, and therefore you should not be troubled nor fearful. Let's be sure, as the people of Christ, that we do not have things hanging over us that no longer belong there because of the blood and the cross of Jesus Christ. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Notice this, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding surrounds us, guards us, and protects us. And notice that the peace of Christ should rule in our hearts. What does it take to establish peace? What does it take to maintain peace? What does it take to order my mind so that there is peace? Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And when we find that there are people who seem to be so troubled, the question is, where then is the dictum that would say the peace of Christ must be ruling in your heart and with thanksgiving? Being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, in friendships, in marriages, in churches, among the body of believers, we should be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit, notice what, in the bond of peace. He is the Prince of Peace, and we are to follow in the footsteps of the Prince of Peace. So then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. How many people along the way have we met who seem to be doing anything except seeking true peace? Why, I found out if you would just give me $54 million, I could buy a new jet, and I could fly all around the world, speaking of the peace of Jesus Christ. And in the meantime, if you also buy for me a three million house, I would have a real sense of peace and tranquility. Oh, by the way, that is not really my request. I just saw what some other preachers are doing on TV, that's all. I knew I missed my calling when I went to the pulpit instead of to television. <laughs> Nothing sarcastic here, of course. But notice that our pursuit is for the things that make peace. When we gather together as a congregation, we gather here to support the concept of peace the sense of oneness that builds up one another. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. We are to do those things which seem to be impossible, but by the grace and the power of God through His Spirit, these things are possible. And notice that our requirement, as we see it in 1 Corinthians 4, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful we leave the end result to God. And notice then this, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, as we go, our shoes should be peace and tranquility. As we go, how will they preach unless they are sent? And just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. The gospel of peace is our calling. 
We are to live that and have that peace in our own hearts, in our own marriages, in our own families, in our own congregations, and in Christian fellowships that exceed the congregation. And notice that all of these things are due to Jesus Christ. You take Jesus Christ away, you have nothing. You hardly even have fragments because they also disappear. So the real question is simply this. Is Jesus Christ the Lord of my life? And if that is the truth, then we can say as it was said of old, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. May the peace of Christ rest in the hearts and the minds of each of us this day. And if you don't have Christ this day, you don't know his peace. May you come to know it this day. Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, we thank you for Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Prince of peace. We thank you that he is all of these things to us. All in all, he is our salvation and our life. And we thank you for him. And if we stack two things in two rows, all the things that this life can give us without Christ, it's here for a while and gone, even as it is with us. But if we have Jesus Christ, there is not one thing of everlasting value that would ever be lost, including our own souls. And we thank you for such love and for such grace. We thank you for Jesus Christ, the transforming power, and also the agent of your grace and the outpouring of your peace. In Christ's name we pray, amen.